We've been in a series called Crosswords, and we're looking at nine different words that are used to describe the cross, describe what happened on the cross, uh, describe what God wants to do in us and through us on the cross. Uh, some truths that I hope will really challenge you uh, during this season as we lead, uh, lead up to Easter. And uh, today, I want to I wanna look at a word, and, and I believe that this, of all the ones that I've talked about, this is probably going to one be the one that's going to push on us maybe the most in our own journey of faith. And uh, so track with me uh, as, we, as, as, we walk, as we walk through this. If you wanna look at, uh, take your sermon outline out. If, if you got your bulletin, you can track along with me. We'll throw everything up on the screen if you'd love to, rather just watch. We're gonna look at a passage of scripture from Mark uh, chapter 15. Before I jump to that, just remind you, there are Bibles in the pews in front of you, and uh, those Bibles are our gift to you. You can uh, read along in those if you want to. If you'd like to take one of those Bibles home, uh, we'd be happy to give that to you. You're, you're welcome to, or if you have someone that needs a Bible and you'd like to take it to them, please feel free to do so. Do note that, that they are Bibles, that uh, some of the Bibles are English, some of the Bibles are Spanish. Uh, just make sure you get the right ones. I want to look at an interesting story um, on the day of the crucifixion that uh, I think has, a real, has some real power for us as we look at it. Mark chapter 15, uh, beginning at verse 20, it says, And when they were finally tired of mocking Jesus, they took off the purple robe that they'd put on him, and they, they put on his own clothes again, and they led him away to be crucified. Now listen to this. A passerby named Simon who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And when they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, and they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Now, it's interesting um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what we call the synoptic gospels, because they all kind of follow the same pattern, all three tell the same story about Simon. Uh, Mark mentions Simon's kids in, in this, his two boys, Alexander and Rufus. John was the only gospel that didn't mention it. John talks about Jesus walking away, carrying his own cross. So most likely, Jesus started out carrying his cross, but because he had been whipped, um, you remember he had 39 lashes, he had been beaten, uh, he had a crown of thorns placed on his head. Uh, he had probably lost so much blood and was dehydrating to a point that he probably collapsed under the weight of the cross. You remember, even though he was king of kings and lord of lords, he was in a human body. And that human body most likely just collapsed. And so Simon, this guy from Cyrene, was, was pulled out of the crowd. Now, Cyrene was be in what we know now as Libya in northern Africa, and probably from the eastern part. Back in 300 B.C., uh, Ptolemy of uh, Seder was, was the guy who made, uh, uh, dispersed a whole bunch of the Jews uh, to that area, probably about 100,000 of them that time. And Simon was a Jew who had brought his two boys to Jerusalem to be there for the Passover. And as he gets there for the Passover, he's watching this event. And of all the people, again, in the crowd, he pulls Simon out to carry the cross of Christ. Now, we read that story, and it's kind of like, wow, that's an interesting story. We start putting ourselves in the story. I wonder, I wonder what it would have been like if I had been picked to be the one. What, it, what would it have been like if you were the one who had been picked to carry the cross of Christ? Let me, let me, let me frame this a little differently. What would it mean for us to carry the cross of Christ now? You see, I don't think the story of Simon is just a great story of history. I think it's a great picture of the walk of faith that God calls us all to. The word I, I want to look at today is the word partnership. Just think this thought with me. Jesus wouldn't have gotten his cross to Calvary unless Simon had partnered with him. Now, what would it mean for us to partner with Jesus today? What would it look like for us to help Jesus carry his cross? 
Well, that's, that's what I want to talk about and unpack with you a little bit. Um, one way it might look, throw that picture up on the screen, could look like this. Um, this could be one way you get, I guess, you could carry it across. Uh, this guy right here, you see in his picture, his name is Arthur Bissett. Um, back in, he was an old hippie back in, back in the 60s, and he was living in California. He started a coffee shop, and he had a big cross that he had in there that he liked to cart back and forth. And he, he said that one day he just felt like God gave him this idea about carrying this cross around and was kind of using it as a conversational piece to start up conversations about Jesus. And so on Christmas Day, 1969, uh, Arthur heads out from Calif uh, Hollywood, California. He lives on the Sunset Strip there. Has that cross, like you see it, kind of lost over his shoulder with a wheel. And he walks all the way to Washington, D.C. Not, not a, I don't know how many steps I've got today, but I didn't have that many, I guarantee, I guarantee. He walked all the way to Washington, D.C. And he got there, and he, he had a lot of time to, along the way to have conversations with people. He had an opportunity to preach in churches. He got to talk a lot, of, a lot about his faith in Christ, why he was doing what he did. And it kind of became his ministry, and he kept doing this. He kept doing this for the next 50-plus years. In fact, I know as of at least last year, 2022, he was still doing this. Arthur has walked in every country on the planet. In fact, every major island group on the planet. According to his calculations, he's logged over 43,000 miles carrying that cross. Now, that's one way you could do it. And if you're like me, I could probably use the exercise. You know, that would, that's probably one way to do it. But I think there's probably a more, a more practical way, maybe even a more useful way that God would want to challenge us. Now, here's my thought today, and I just want you to keep this question in the back of your mind. What would it look like for me to partner with Jesus in carrying his cross? Pastor Steve, how could I do that? I'm glad you asked. Are you ready? I'm just going to give you a few ways that you could put this into practice. Here's the first one. Very simple. Be a vessel of Christ's healing love. You can carry the cross by being a vessel of Christ's healing love. You know, two weeks ago, when I started this series, you remember I talked about the first word that we used was the word love. If the cross was about anything, it was about this demonstration of God's great love for us. Oh, don't miss this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that if anyone would believe in him, they wouldn't have to perish, but that they could have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Here's the good news, folks. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or how long you've been there. God's great arms of grace reach out open to you. And he's willing to forgive you of your past simply because he loves you so much. That's what the cross was all about. When Simon picked up this cross and carried it for Jesus, he was carrying the greatest symbol of love that the world would ever know. Now think this with me. You get the chance to do that. Not just on one given day like Simon, you get the chance to be a vessel of that love every single day. To a few different people. Can I give them to you? I, I was thinking this through, and I just, it just blew my mind how many opportunities are to do this. Let me just give you a few. You can be a vessel of Christ's love to those who are hurting. To those who are hurting. I, I love what, Jesus, what, the, what the Gospel of Matthew says in, in Matthew 9 when it talks about how Jesus looked at the crowds of people. And it says, and what pity he felt for the crowds that came. Read it out loud with me. Because their problems were so great and they didn't know what, what to do or where to go for help. They were like sheep, like a, like a sheep without a shepherd. Now, just look at me for a second. Where can you find hurting people? Not a trick question. Everywhere. Everywhere. You see this crowd right here today? If we're honest, there are a lot of us right here who are hurting. 
You see, everywhere you go this week, doesn't matter, to school, to work, to Walmart, it doesn't matter where you go. Here's what I can tell you without hesitation. There are going to be hurting people everywhere you go. And there are, they are people who need someone to demonstrate that love of God to them. You know, this, this last week, I was, in, um, I was in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I posted that on Facebook, Suffering for Jesus. They're on an, you know, an oceanfront resort. And, um, but I, I was there for a pastor's retreat. There were a group of 50 to 60 pastors and wives, and they had asked me to come and be their speaker for, for the few days. And um, I had the, the greatest thing about doing that kind of stuff are these conversations that I get into with the people while I'm there. And I'll never forget one, one of the, of the uh, services that we had. After the service, I was just talking with different people. And I had one of the pastors who came up to me, and he said, can I talk to you for a second? And I said, sure. And we kind of stepped to the side. And this pastor just began to pour out his heart about all this stuff that he was dealing with and the weight that he was carrying and the pain that he was in. And, 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 and again, you see, what's funny is, who do you talk to when you're a pastor? You know, I mean, I got to, I'm so blessed. I'm married to a therapist. I mean, every, y'all, y'all appreciate this. Every single day after dealing with you, I get to go home and lay on the couch. <laughs> yeah. Now, for those of you who, who may see Wanda, you know, I think she charges 50 bucks an hour at, at the most. She gets my whole paycheck, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that took about it. But, but, you know, pastors, they, they feel like there's no one to talk. And I stood there and I listened to this pastor just walk through this. And, and as, I, as I listened to him and I tried to empathize with him and I gave him some counsel, I just put my arm around him and I said, can I pray with you? And as I prayed with him, this pastor just stood there and bawled like a baby. And it reminded me, it doesn't matter who you're with. It doesn't matter whether they are people who don't know God, whether they are people who you think are nominal Christians, or whether they are pastors like me. People are hurting everywhere you go. And a part of the way that we help carry the cross of Christ is to get up in the morning and say, Lord, I'm going to run into some people today who have some pain that I don't know anything about. Would you help me be your vessel of love? Amen? Does that make sense? And and another group of people, and and some of you can really appreciate this, is is to those who are hopeless. Those who are hopeless. You know, I wrote the other day in one of my my daily devotionals that I write, I I, I wrote about the, the idea that how thankful I am that God didn't give up on me. How many of you are thankful for that too? God didn't give up on you. Because there's so many times in my journey, you know, that I I hear that voice in my ear. You know, you're not worthy, you're not able, you're not, you know, blah, 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 blah. And and, and there's so many people I talk to, that's that's their story. You know, and some of a lot of us have had people who have given up on us. And and I just thought about the fact that you and I are gonna run into people and they think they're hopeless. They think they've trashed their lives too badly. They think they are beyond the grace of God, that they are beyond the love of God. They are people who have had people in their life tell them, you're, you're worth nothing. You know, I, I quit. And some, some, some of you, some of us, we're gonna run into some of these people and they need someone who can let them know God will never give up on you. And you know what? I'm not going to give up on you either. I'm not going to give up on you either. You know, when I was, when I was writing this, I, I thought about um, Levi in Matthew 5, who was a tax collector, and how he, he, he followed Jesus. Jesus said, follow me, and he leaves his accounting desk, and he follows Jesus. And it says that night, Levi has this party at his house, and he invites all of his friends who were the, the biggest sinners in town. And he's got all these people, and it talks about, you know, one of the translations calls them famous sinners. <laughs> I would like to be known as a famous sinner, notorious sinners. And they got this gathering, and Jesus is sitting with this group of crowd. He, he's quite at ease, and he's having this conversation. Some of the religious leaders look at the disciples and go, how in the world could Jesus hang out with people like this? And Jesus hears this, and he says, are you kidding me? This is the reason I came. Healthy people don't need a doctor. It's sick people. The impossible people in your life, they are the ones who need the God of the impossible. Amen? Grace that is greater. 
than all of our sin. I love how Paul said it in Ephesians 2. He said, you know what? Talking to us, in those days you were living apart from God. Read it with me. You lived in this world without God and without hope. And you can be that vessel of love to some of those people. Here's the third one, and these are even more challenging for us. We need to be that vessel of love, of Christ's love, to those who are hard to love. People who are hard to love. (laughs) Come on, it's church, great place to confess. How many of you be honest enough to admit you've got some people in your life who are hard to love? Yeah, how many of you brought them with you this morning? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, you know, it, it's, it's true. We have these people. Pe- you know, I, one pastor said, you know, I would love ministry if it wasn't for people. You know, I just, well, because people can be so annoying. <laughs> I, 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 I laughed, I, I read this article, this news article a, a few months ago, and it was talking about this guy in Dublin who lived not too far from the Dublin airport. And the company that kind of oversees the Dublin airport, they had a line, a number that you could call to complain. Now, how many of you have got some chronic complainers in your life? Anybody got, yeah, yeah, you, you kind of somebody, you know, they're here, I can't, I can't say that, but they're, they're you know. I, I, this was so crazy. In 2020, think about this, this guy called the airport hotline to complain 6,227 times. Now, if you do the math, that's 17 times a day in 2020. He called to complain about the noise, and the airport responds to every single call. Well, you think that's something. 2021, <laughs> he called 12,272 times, or 34 times a day. In 2022, I didn't get to see all the statistics, but for the first three months, he was calling 59 times a day in 2022, which if he does that all year, will be 21,535 times. There are some people, they're just hard to love. Look at me. And see, that's what makes the special. Look, hear my heart. Anybody can love people who are lovable. Anybody can love people who are easy to get along with. If you want to really challenge your heart with this, go back and read Matthew 5 again. Because Jesus just gets right in our faces about this, saying, you know, if, you only, if you're only nice to the people who are nice to you, what good is that? Even pagan people do that. Look at the passage of scripture, Matthew 5, that I give you there. Jesus said, read it with me, church. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your... Now circle the word enemies. And when you're home in a private place, you might want to write some names down right there. (laughs) Because there are some people in our lives that God is challenging us to love. Because that's what it... Look at me. That's what it means to have a cross-carrying love. Can I give you a second thought? That's probably enough to go home and camp on, isn't it? But let me me give you a second thought that I had. When we talk about carrying the cross of Christ, it also means to be an agent of Christ's transforming grace. To be an agent of Christ's transforming grace. (coughs) Simon had no idea the significance of what he was doing. He, all he knew was that these Roman soldiers made him do this, so he's carrying this cross of Christ to Golgotha. But it was through that crucifixion that God's grace was poured out upon the world. You remember the old song? What can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Simon, in this moment of history, partnered with Jesus in helping to save the entire human race. Oh, please don't miss this. And you get a chance to be a part of that every single day. 
You see, Christ is the one who does the saving, but we are the vessels through which his grace is poured out upon people. Look at this passage of scripture. Let this challenge your heart. When Paul was writing to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 5.20, here's what he says. Read it with me. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Now, when I was camping on this thought, the thing that hit me was, can you imagine how scared Simon was when they pulled him out of that crowd? I mean, he didn't know, you know what all was going on, but he knew he was going to carry this. These soldiers are, are intimidating. They, he didn't know what they were going to do to him. So, he, I mean, he's scared to death carrying this thing. About, and, and it hit me, uh, of all the things that we are afraid of as Christians, can we be honest? There is probably nothing that scares us more than the idea of sharing our faith with someone else. I'm sure of that. Why? Because we don't do it. Think about this. Paul says we're ambassadors for Christ. We we are the only way that people are going to know about Jesus. We often, as Christians, complain about the the downhill trend of this world. And, you know, you'll read it on Facebook. Oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And it's true. Look at me. But we're the only people who can stop it. We're the only people who know, have the knowledge and the understanding to to share with them that you don't have to go to hell. You you can embrace God and go to heaven. There there is, we are the agents of God. Now, I know that scares you. And and we think of a thousand reasons why we said, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't know that much. And what if they ask me a question I can't answer? You know, what, you know, and we, we, we think of all these reasons why we can't. But here's the deal, gang. We have to. That's a part of what it means to carry the cross of Christ. Now, I, I just want to give you just a couple of thoughts. I want to make this really easy for you. And you know, we got to find a way to overcome our fear and you don't have to become a Bible scholar. You don't have to become, thankfully, a pastor. You don't, you don't have to. But here, here are a few ways that we can do this. I give you three words on your outline there. The first word is share. And here's what I mean by that. You can share your story. You can share your story. I had three different people this week that I sat with. And I said to them, tell me your story. And it was so interesting because one person um, when they were talking to me, we were just talking about, you know, kind of having a life a long way from God and, and how they've struggled. And, you know, and they were, you know, they were hesitant to, to tell me what they were going through and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, and they come to our church. And, and they, were, they were going to this, and, and you could tell they were, they were struggling like, you know, I'm the only one in the audience who's got a story like that. And, and, and I looked at them, and I said, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> I said, I know a lot of stories that sit in our church every single Sunday, and and trust me when I say, they're they're not all pretty stories. But here's the deal. Look at me. Don't miss this. People need to hear your story. Whatever your story is. We all have a different one, but people need to hear your story. Your story is the most powerful piece that God has given you. There is nothing more uh, moving for people than a testimonial. I can, I can give people, you know, uh, an hour's worth of theology, but I promise you put one person on stage who shares their story of God's redemption, and it's ten times more powerful than anything I've said. I, I love it. In John chapter 9, there's a guy who was born blind. Jesus heals him. And uh, later... He's being confronted by these religious leaders who are trying to, you know, figure out what happened. And when they find out that, you know, who, you know, who, who, who was Jesus? Who was he claiming? Was he, was he Elijah? And the guy says, I don't know. Was he a prophet? The guy says, I don't know. And he says, well, you know, did he have a demon? He says, I, I don't know. He, he goes, this is all I know. I once was blind and now I see. Now, you, you don't have to be a scholar. You, you don't have to, you know, have a whole lot of Bible background. But you can tell people your story of what God's done for you. And your story, I promise you, will touch and change the hearts of people if if you're willing, as God leads, to simply share your story. There's a a second word there that that scares us a little bit, and it's the word invite. You can can be an an ambassador for Christ by by simply inviting people to church. 
Did you know that 75 to 90% of the people who come to church and come to Christ come because a friend, relative, or neighbor invited them? So here's the question. Who have you invited? It's not that hard to invite a neighbor or a family member to church. It's not that hard to invite them to an event. That, 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 it's through a simple invitation, people's lives can change. Um, got a great picture of this. Throw that picture up on the screen for me. Um, this is last year in April, we had a, a youth group reunion. Uh, Steve Cottom, a member of our church, uh, Steve was in sixth grade when I came here in 1981 to be the youth pastor. And uh, through those years, uh, we had some, some incredible kids and some incredible things happen. Steve and uh, three other kids in my youth group came to me one day uh, after I'd been here for a year or so. And they said, we would like to have a boys basketball team. And I said, fantastic. I, I love basketball. You know, I'd love to have a boys basketball team. Here's what I need. I need eight guys who are committed that will come to church once a week, either Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night. And those same eight guys who would be willing to, who would be committed to come to a practice. I've got the church van. I'll pick them up, but I need, I need their commitment that they'll be there. These four guys looked at me and said, well, there's only four of us. I said, that's your problem. So what did they do? They went out and they started inviting their friends. Hey guys, would you guys like to come uh, be a part of this boys basketball team? And some of those friends started coming and those friends invited friends and some of those friends invited girls and some girls found out we had some boys in our youth group and they started, they started coming. And, and I, one day when we sat down and started counting names, I, th I think we were like 33 or 34 kids that we identified that came to church because of an invitation from one of the kids in our youth group to come and be a part of the basketball team or came during that, during that time frame. Last year we had this reunion and we had a group of them. These are several of the people from that youth group and, from their, and, and their families. But I can point out in this group right here, 10 different individuals who came to our church, came to Christ. Some of them ended up going into full-time ministry. Uh, some who are active leaders in their church today. Uh, I can point out 10 different kids who came. All they, they, Their lives were changed all because somebody invited them to come to church. It's not that hard. But it makes a huge difference. And the third word I give you is the word Connect. And by the word connect, I mean kind of going back to what I talked about with the hurting people and loving on them, is that sometimes what people need is a simple invitation or, or what people need is a simple touch where you let them know that you care about them and, they let, and you let them know that you're a believer who believes God can help them. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a conversation with someone that I didn't really know. And somewhere along the way, they, they start telling me about some of the things that they're going through. And as I listen, I say, can I pray for you? And in 43 years of being in ministry, I've only had one time when someone said, no, I'd rather you not. But all the rest of the times, people said, that would be great. Now, here, I want you, please want you to hear my heart. This is why I want you to learn the, the simple skill of praying out loud. Because if you came to me out in the lobby and you told me like between services someone did and came to me and said, I'm, I'm dealing with this tomorrow, um, would you pray for me? I can say, I'll pray for you and you'll nod at me and you, you'll feel it. But what I said to them is what we can say to people is, how about if I pray with you right now? And I just put my hand on their shoulder and I pray a very simple prayer that sounds something like this. Lord, you know what they're facing. You know what they're going through. And you know how afraid they are. And Lord, I pray that you would remind them today that you will never leave them or forsake them. And we believe that you're going to have your hand upon them and see them through. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at me. You can't miss this. A 30 to 45 second prayer can change someone's life. All you got to be is just simply bold enough to ask for the privilege of praying. Does this make sense to you? Share your story, invite them, and connect. Let me give you one last one. Another way that we carry the cross of Christ is by being a model of cross-carrying faith in Christ. Being a model of cross-carrying faith in Christ. 
when Simon was carrying the cross of Jesus up that hill, he, he had no idea that this was actually going to be the picture that Jesus was going to use for all time of what a true, uh, true disciple would look like. Look, look at what Jesus said before he was ever crucified. Look, look at what he says in Luke chapter 9. Then Jesus said to the crowd, read it with me, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take your cross daily, and follow me. In other words, Jesus says this is what it really means to be a, a, a disciple of mine. Now, we, we don't really know what happened with Simon after the crucifixion. We don't really know. But if you connect the dots in the scriptures, you, you can see some things where, of what might have happened. In other words, in Acts chapter 2, um, you, you find when Peter was preaching, it says, and some of them, uh, people who were hearing, were, were just blown away by what Peter was saying. And 3,000 people got saved and baptized that day. And it says, and some of them were men from Cyrene. Could have been other believers. Could have been Simon and his boys. Uh, you, you find later in, in Acts chapter um, 11, I believe, uh, you find uh, some, some guys from Cyrene at Antioch uh, preaching the, to the Greeks, you know, and it could have been anyone, but it's possible that it was Simon and his boys. His boys would have had to have been teenagers to, to be able to even go to Jerusalem with him like that. You find in, in, in Romans chapter 16, now what's interesting, Mark's gospel, almost all scholars agree, Mark was writing to the people in Rome. Look at what Paul in his letter to the Romans said in Acts chapter 16. Read it with me. He says, greet who? Rufus, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own and his own dear mother who has become like a mother to me. In other words, here you see Rufus, one of the sons. Now, it's possible it was a different Rufus, but why would Mark take the time to identify Alexander and Rufus if, if, if later that this wasn't this guy? And all I want to say is that it's obvious that Simon's life was much more than that one moment of time. Now, here's why this is so important. When we talk about what does it mean to, to truly be a Christian, we, we hear things like, well, just make a decision for Jesus. Look at me. This thing is much more than a decision. It's much more than just a decision. Jesus said, pick up your cross daily. Follow me. Deny your own life. Set what you want aside to choose the agenda of God. Now, here, here's the problem. I put this on your outline. When I probably, there, there are some of us that would call ourselves, we're believers. What do you mean? Well, I, I believe there was a Jesus. That's really great. James, in his epistle, says, even the demons believe. And so if all you do is just believe, you're, you're in good company because all the demons agree with you. That's, that's a great group to belong to. Some of us would consider ourselves to be faithful followers, and, and that's great. And, and there's nothing wrong with following Jesus, because Jesus did say, follow me. But a lot of the people who were in the crowd that day that ran around were followers of Jesus. Christ calls us to a deeper level of commitment, and it's this. He calls us to be cross-carrying partners. Would you describe yourself? that way. Hear my heart, gang, please. I'm not trying to heap guilt on you. I'm not trying to demean you, put you down. Here's what I am trying to do. I'm trying to call us all to a deeper level of this journey of faith than we've been on. This world needs more than believers. This world needs more than just followers. This world needs some people who aren't afraid to pick up the cross of Christ and follow him. To live lives of distinction. Does this make sense to you? And my question to us today would be this. What's keeping us from being a cross-carrying follower? A cross-carrying partner? What's keeping us from being that? I'm going to ask my prayer partners to go ahead and come on down. And this morning, I've asked Rachel to lead us in a song. It's a beautiful, beautiful old song from Hillsong. It talks about lead me to the cross. It's just got beautiful words to it. And 
This morning, I don't know how you might need prayer today. Uh, you may need prayer for something going on in your personal life or something that you're facing, and you'd like one of the prayer partners to pray with you about that. That'd be great. There may be some of you, you feel God kind of pushing on you to, to, to go deeper, uh, to, to stretch higher. And this morning, if you would like one of our prayer partners to pray with you about that, you're more than welcome to come, and any one of them would be happy to do that. Some of you may want a moment alone, and the altars are open. If you just want to come and just kneel before God and say, Lord, you know my heart. You know what I'm struggling with, and I just want to have this moment with you. Or you can pray right there in the pews. It doesn't really matter to me. But I want to double dog dare you to move from a believer and a follower to a partner. Will you let God take you there? Lead us, Rachel. Savior, I come quiet my soul. Remember redemption's here where your blood was spilled for my ransom everything i once held dear i can Father, that's our prayer today, that you would take us back to this story and remind us that each and every day we have the privilege of doing what Simon was forced to do. We can carry your cross. Lord, we are saved only by your grace. We are right with you only because you laid your life down for us. So teach us how in like manner, to lay our lives down for you, to let ourselves be vessels of your love everywhere we go, for the hurting people, for the impossible, hopeless people, and for the people who are hard and difficult to love. Help us be your ambassadors, Lord, to share our story, to invite, to connect, to let your spirit move through us as we would Invite people to come to know you as we have come to know you. And, and Father, we pray that you would change us to live lives of distinction. But Lord, we don't, we don't have to be hokey or cheesy. We don't have to carry 50-pound Bibles and wear big cross medallions around our neck. But 
Lord, I pray that you would help us to live such lives of character and integrity and empathy and selflessness that when people see us, they notice the difference. Lord, you say that our lives should be attractive to people. And we pray that you would help us to rid ourselves of anything that gets in the way of that, that we might carry your cross with honor. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the way you laid your life down for us. Help us pick up our cross daily and follow you. In your precious name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen.